Uh, okay, so uh, let's go over a little reminder of the uh, the classical uh, FFT that probably is familiar. Uh, so we have some set um, set of, of powers of uh, some element G, and we assume the the order of G is the power of two. And we, we want to evaluate some polynomial of degree uh, smaller than n on the points of S. Uh, so, right, this is a pretty, pretty common, uh, common thing we do when we do snarks. And the, 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 right, the basic trick, uh, how, how we do this efficiently, is we we write we decompose f to the even and odd coefficients, so we write f is like f even of x squared plus x times f odd of x squared. And why is this useful? Uh, well, f even and, and f odd are now polynomials of degree n over two instead of n. And also, the, this mapping of going from x to x squared, when you apply it on the elements of s, then it's a two to one map. Uh, so we've reduced evaluating one polynomial of degree n at n points to evaluating uh, two polynomials of degree n over two at n over two points. And Again, because s is of if size a power of two, we can continue to to uh, continue this recursively, and that's what gives us the the well known n log n um, FFT. So I don't know what the background here of people is that familiar. Does that compile? Thank you. Exactly. <laughs> uh, right. So uh, personally, I. I I, I'm happy with this. I don't know what what more you need, but people are are greedy. So some greedy people they ask, uh, well, this requires the the power of two to to divide uh, p minus one to have such a g, which I I think okay is fine. But uh, but say n uh, instead of p minus one divides p plus one, where p is the size of our field, can we still have a fast f of t? And uh, yeah, the reason people care about this is they want to work with fields where the p is as like simple as possible when you're presented in base two. So the simplest possible p is um, percent prime of the form uh, two to the k minus one. Like especially the percent prime uh, two to the thirty one minus one is what a lot of snark people are uh, very excited about. So if you want to work with that, uh, you won't have p minus one dividing a, a large power of two, but obviously if it's a percent prime p plus one, for example, two to the 31, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll have contain a large power of two. So can we do uh, fast FFTs when n divides p plus one? Uh, so so let's, uh, to, Let's reflect a little, a little abstractly on why the FFT works. Uh, so we have this map uh, going from x to g times x. And what's nice about this map is that it goes over the set S in, as a cycle. It goes over when you keep up, you start from some point in S and you apply this map, it'll go over all the points in, in a cycle. Now, because n is a power of two and this sigma is a cycle, if you now define the map tau to be sigma applied n over two times, uh, so, so what will tau be? Well, in this case, it'll simply be, be the map uh, x, uh, x goes to minus x. Uh, but simply from the fact that, uh, that, that sigma was, was a cycle, uh, we, know, we know two things. We know that tau is a like has order two, meaning that if you 
apply it twice, you just get the identity map. So tau squared x is always x. And also, we know uh, that it must uh, split, uh, split s into disjoint pairs. Like, if you look at pairs a, tau of a, it's gonna, the pairs will be disjoint. Uh, and one more thing we, we know, if we look at sort of, you can think it's called n because it sort of corresponds to norm maps of, of field extensions. If you look at the map going from x to x times tau of x, so this will simply be minus x squared in, 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 uh, in this case, then this n maps the, the, the pairs into the same output. Right, because the, because the pairs are like a tau of a, then when you apply on that, um, you know, x goes to x times tau of x, it must map, and tau is order two, it must map a and tau of a to, it must map the pairs to the same thing. So this motivates the question, can we, find a set of size p plus one uh, and an, uh, some operation sigma on it that is cyclical in like, like, this, uh, like this G is. And this, this uh, very naturally brings up the, what's called the projective line. So we want to have a set of size p plus one where our field is of size p. So a nat natural set to look at is what's called the projective line, which is simply taking your field and sort of adding the, the point at infinity. And now, so we have we have this set, uh, this little slightly weird set, F, the field union, the point at infinity. And we want to look at operations that can sort of cycle over this set. So the natural operations are, are the fractional maps. So we can take, look at a map sigma x that goes to one over ax plus b. Uh, and then the question, okay, how is this map defined over P? Or, so the two points where it's like you, you're not sure what, to, what sigma should do, uh, one point is sort of the pole, right? Uh, sigma of minus B over A. You're, go you're gonna get um, zero in the denominator. So we'll just define that sigma minus B over A as infinity. And then the question is, well, what is infinity map to? So right, it's sort of like one my, one over infinity. So let's let's say sigma of infinity goes to zero. And uh, a, a claim that you can find in the paper of uh, uh, Li and Sheng uh, uh, that uh, this talk is based on is that you can find some a and b such that uh, applying sigma will give you a cycle over all of, of p. Uh, okay, so now let's let's talk a little about. I mean, what is this F union infinity like? How do people formally represent the projective line? And we'll sort of go over three options. So the first thing is projective coordinates. So you'll represent your field elements as sort of ratios, as C as pairs C D. Uh, such that A is the, is the ratio C over D. And then, uh, so for example, A1 always represents A. 
So, so a field element now has multiple representatives. That's what a little uh, sometimes complicated or annoying in the projective representation. Uh, and, and then, okay, the, when you represent things as ratios, uh, so, so then when you have zero at the, as the right, co right coordinate, then very naturally that, that'll be infinity. So like the elements A0, uh, you'll think of them all as representatives of infinity. And uh, yeah, and one nice thing, I mean, it's not too relevant to this talk, is that although an element has many representatives, you can uh, use homogeneous polynomials and in a well-defined way say what it means for a polynomial to, to operate over um, or be zero uh, over a projective point, independent of your choice of representatives. So projective coordinates, that's what, one way how people work with a projective line. Uh, and then another thing you can do is go from the line to the plane and uh, look at a circle in the plane. And I, I don't know how uh, clear this, this drawing is. So the idea is now we can, we can map the points in the circle to the, to the line how by um, always starting at the north point of the circle. And now to, to say what a point in the circle uh, maps to in the line, we, we draw a line through that point, see where it meets the line. And that gives us the, the mapping between the circle and the line. And then you can ask, well, so the, the point at the north of the circle, uh, right, if you draw sort of a tangent line to the, uh, circle, like where will it meet the line? And then we sort of say, okay, that point is mapped at infinity, right? Or another way to do it is you take sort of the infinite line and you, you bend it uh, into a circle. Uh, and then again, you get that sort of the north point of the circle uh, is, is sort of mapped to the point at infinity. Uh, and this, this paper, uh, Circle Stark, it, um, this is sort of the approach it takes for, for uh, describing these, these FFTs. Um, and, and now a, a, third, a third way to um, represent the projective line, and this is where it gets much more algebraic and abstract, is to represent the projective line as what's called the places of the field of rational functions. Uh, so what does that mean? And <laughs> the last part of this talk will be mainly to give you some feeling of what, what this means. Um, so we, do people remember the, the definition of, of ring? So a, a ring is a, is a set of elements that's closed under addition and, and multiplication, but not necessarily inverse. Uh, so a value, a valuation ring uh, in the in the field K of rational of rational functions is a subring where for every element in the in the uh, field uh, either it's in the ring or its inverse is in the ring or both. That's that's fine. So that's this is what's called a valuation ring, right? Very sort of abstract ad hoc definition uh, at, at first glance. Um, and what do these valuation rings look like? So the main example is you choose some A in your uh, base field. That, sorry, that F should be like you know, all the other Fs. And you look basically at the, the set of all functions that don't have a pole at A. So right, all f over g, um, where g of a is is non-zero. And right, you can you can check that this this is a this is a ring that it's closed under addition and multiplication. Um, and right, and you can check it's re it really satisfies this definition, right? Because um, for any rational function, if it doesn't have a pole at a, if g, you know, so it's already in R a. If it does, then 
uh, well, f over g, you know, if, if you have f over g where g does have a pole at a, well, okay, so g over f uh, will, will not have a pole at a. Um, right, so, so this is sort of the, the ring of functions that are well-defined at A. Uh, and the, these valuation rings, they're also called the, the places of, of K. And uh, so... A cool thing is that you can sort of abstractly evaluate at A with this framework. So uh, the, the unique maximal ideal of, of RA will be always, uh, will be this set, which is just all the elements of RA times X minus A. And uh, the, the cool thing is if we want to evaluate some function RA at A, we can define the evaluation as taking taking that R, that function mod IA. So that will give us some field element and, and this will be the result of, that, of, all of this abstract sort of operation will be the same as just evaluating the function at A in the, in the normal way. Um, Okay, but if you look at all, so there's some way to define degree uh, for, for these valuation rings. Uh, it's actually just when you take the ring mod its maximal ideal, it's gonna be some uh, algebraic extension of the base field. So in whatever the degree of the extension, that, that will be the degree of the, of the place. And there's one more place in, in K in the field of rational functions uh, that we can call R infinity. Um, and this is all, f over g such that the degree of f is smaller or equal to the degree of g. Uh, so, so, right, so you can think of r infinity as sort of as a set of fa functions that can be evaluated at infinity. If the degree of g is like uh, at least the degree of f, then right when we go to infinity, in a sense, um, the, val the, the, out the value doesn't go to infinity. It goes to some finite value. So, right, so it turns out where we start with this very ab abstract definition of what a valuation ring is, and it turned out that the, the valuation rings of, of degree one are exactly the, the points on the projective line. Uh, okay, so... Uh, we started with talking about FFT and then we went to this really abstract uh, notion of places. Uh, so what is, again, this is not something you can explain in 20 minutes, but very briefly, what does this have to do with uh, FFTs? So, uh, right, if we go back a bit, what, what we needed, we wanted to do is we, we needed to represent our F as some combination of two functions f, e, n of x. Now write n in the normal FFT, it's x squared. It's just x squared. Uh, but, but here in this context, since we're going to start with this fractional transformation instead of just x goes to g times x, n is going to be some degree two rational function. Uh, and we'll, we need to figure out how to combine, how to represent f as two elements of, of, uh, that look like that with n of x inside. Uh, that have half the degree, right? Uh, where also the question is, what, what does degree mean? mean? So uh, very briefly, the, the idea is that uh, working with these concepts of valuation rings and, and what's called function fields and uh, what's called Riemann-Roch spaces that uh, I didn't say anything about, it gives us uh, very convenient tools to construct the right bases for representing F F E and F O, and also defining degree in a way that really like F E and F O will have half the degree of F as in the classical F of T. Uh, yeah, so for more details, look at the, uh, on the archive, it's by Li and Xing, uh, the paper is called the, I'm 
embarrassed to say I forgot the exact name of the paper, but something GFFT, Galois FFT. Uh, all right, thank you very much.